Uh, so today we're uh, we're very pleased to be joined by Professor Karen Adolf. So I'll just give you the uh, the brief official biography. So Karen Adolf is the Julia Silver Professor of Psychology and Professor of Applied Psychology at New York University. Uh, she primarily studies infant motor behavior uh, using such techniques as uh, motion tracking, eye tracking, EEG, and also uh, making babies walk off cliffs. Um, uh, she's currently the director of uh, the Databury Video Library, which is a very ambitious uh, video corpus project looking at um, real life interaction, real life behavior of infants. Uh, she's a fellow of the American Psychological Association uh, and of the Association for Psychological Science. She is the recipient of multiple prestigious awards, the author of over 180 research articles and publications. Uh, and she's also been continually funded by the NIH since uh, 1991. Uh, so that's the official story. Um, hopefully, we'll get a, a, bit, a bit more, a bit more of the personal story later on. Um, but we're going to start with a, a very brief presentation from uh, from Professor Adolf. Uh, if you're able to share your screen. So I just want to take a few minutes to introduce some ideas. <laughs> Um, here is my worldview in a nutshell. Behavior is the thing to be explained. All behavior is motor behavior. So walking, talking, reaching, looking, interacting with objects, interacting with people, you're always moving something. Behavior must be flexible. That means that movements must be suited to the task at hand and experience promotes behavioral flexibility. You can think of experience in terms of four kind of E's. <laughs> um, learning to move is constrained and facilitated by the current status of the body. Motor behaviors are embedded in a physical environment that offers particular possibilities for action. Experience is shaped by social influences and culturally specific child rearing practices. And experience is enabling new motor skills, create new opportunities for learning and for doing. Experience is embodied. Children learn and develop in a continually changing body. And the functional facts of embodiment depend on, you know, the clothes that children wear and the shoes on their feet and the objects that they carry. Even something as trivial as a diaper affects movements like infant walking. So we compared infant walking while babies were naked, wearing a thin disposable diaper and wearing a bulky old fashioned cloth diaper. Infants walked over an instrumented walkway that records the timing and placement of each footstep. And the bottom line is go naked. <laughs> These are little trails of footprints from a typical infant. When babies walk naked, their steps are close together and in a straight line. And when they're walking in diapers, their step width is larger and their gait is less controlled. Indeed, <laughs> while wearing a bulky cloth diaper, babies walk as badly as they had done seven and a half weeks earlier. And the cost of wearing a thin disposable diaper is five weeks of walking experience. Diapers not only impair walking, they make it harder to walk at all. While they're wearing diapers, more infants misstep and fall compared with walking naked. And like walking, falling is embodied. Bodies of elderly adults are not well suited for falling. <laughs> falling in elders leads to injuries and to hospitalizations. Falling in elders is a huge deterrent to walking. But falling in babies is very different from elders because of the facts of embodiment. Babies fall all the time. They fall while they're playing. They trip over their own feet. They fall when they try to sit down. They fall when they try to stand up. Infants average 39 falls for each hour in motion. And they fall a lot, but they don't care. And their parents don't care. Infants everyday falls are so trivial that the babies rarely fuss and their caregivers rarely show concern. 91% of infant falls, that big green bar 
are uneventful and largely go unnoticed. And babies are back at play right away, even after a big ball. This baby is back at play within three seconds. On average, infants recover from their falls in 1.8 seconds. Moreover, infants don't decrease their walking or shy away from the objects or places associated with their falls. This baby fell 15 times with this pink stroller. Infants walk just as much before and after a fall, they play just as much with the objects that are implicated in their falls and they play just as much in the locations where they fell. An important factor that mitigates the impact of falling is the size and shape and composition of infants' bodies. Babies are short and they're low to the ground and they're padded with baby fat and they move slowly. So the potential energy that's generated by an infant fall is 18 times less than if infants were adult sized and walked at adult speeds. Behavior is constrained and facilitated by the facts of the body. Changes to the body affect movement and the facts of infants' bodies mitigate the consequences of errors. That means that errors don't stop infants from practicing new behaviors. Experience is embedded. The physical environment is always changing. New parts of the environment open up as children's bodies and skills get bigger and better. That means that the environment itself develops. So how do you study learning to move in a variable environment? Well, in my lab, we create obstacles where we can adjust the difficulty of the challenge, and then we observe infants' behaviors. This is an adjustable drop-off apparatus, so it can present really small drop-offs like a step that affords locomotion, or really big drop-offs like a cliff where locomotion is impossible. There's visual and haptic information to tell babies about the relations between their bodies and the environment. They can get information from looking and from touching. Experienced crawling infants select their actions adaptively. So they will easily crawl down drop-offs that are within their ability, but they will not attempt to crawl down drop-offs that are even one centimeter beyond their ability. But look what happens in the same age infants who are new walkers. Novice walkers repeatedly attempt to walk down drop-offs that are beyond their ability. Even on a 90 centimeter drop-off, babies go right over the edge, <laughs> behave as if they have no clue about the limits of their own abilities. But six months later, after infants have several months of walking experience, again, they select their actions adaptively. Again, they can perceive precisely within one centimeter of accuracy whether a drop-off is safe for walking. Experienced 18-month-old walkers look just like experienced 12-month-old crawlers. They know precisely whether a drop-off is too high for walking, and if it's too high, they'll find an alternative strategy. So experience is Im embedded in a physical environment. <laughs> what do babies learn? They're learning to perceive and to exploit new possibilities for action. And part of that learning includes discovering and honing the right exploratory actions. Learning from an earlier developing skill doesn't transfer to a later developing skill. Why not? It's because new skills create new body environment relations and new skills mean new information gathering systems. So the possibilities for crawling and walking are different because there's different relations between the body and the environment. There's different vantage points relative to the ground. There's different visual, haptic, and proprioceptive information. There's different forces acting on different body parts. Experience happens in a social environment surrounded by a culture with particular child rearing practices. 
So all over Central Asia, caregivers use a Gavora cradle. This cradle has no side railings, so the babies are bound to the Gavora with wide straps so they don't fall out. This is a typical infant being put into the Gavora. They're literally bound from their neck to their ankles. And the bindings constrain all of their movements except in their fingers and their toes. And babies are in this cradle for up to 23 hours a day. They're in there from birth until 24 to 30 months when they outgrow the Gavora. And motor milestones in this culture are delayed relative to Western norms. Clothing restricts movements. Babies who wear heavy clothes achieve their prone skills at later ages than infants who wear less bulky clothes. And infants who spend a lot of time in you know, containers like car seats, they achieve their motor skills at older ages than children who are free to move. Pediatricians used to tell parents to put infants to sleep on their tummies prone to prevent them from aspirating milk. But then in 1992, the American Academy of Pediatrics started the back to sleep campaign. So they told parents to put infants to sleep supine on their backs to avoid sudden infant death syndrome. And that led caregivers to encourage less prone time while their infants were awake restricted prone time while kids were awake had the inadvertent consequence of delaying the emergence of prone skills. Now, constraint can lead to delays or later onset ages. Well, exercise can lead to earlier onset ages. Here, you're watching an Armenian man exercising his infant to promote motor development. In many cultures, vigorous exercise like this is integral to child rearing. It's part of parents' expectations about what you should do, what you need to do to ensure that your child has healthy motor development. This is a film of an infant bath in Mali. And you know, the handling and the holding looks rough to Western eyes. But in some cultures, caregivers don't hold their babies like they're a fragile carton of eggs. Cross-cultural work and true experiments, true experiments with random assignment to exercise in control groups in white US infants. <laughs> experiments show that exercise accelerates the onset of skills like sitting and walking, and there's a dose response effect. So the more exercise babies get, the earlier the onset ages. Experience is enculturated. Child rearing practices affect infants' bodies and environments and their activities. And cross-cultural work and experiments show that how you hold your baby or carry your baby or dress or bathe your infant affects motor development. And formal practices like exercise or constraint affect motor development. Experience is enabling. New motor skills and improvements in existing skills create new opportunities for learning. It doesn't guarantee learning. What it does is it sets up the conditions for learning to occur. And that means that development can cascade into domains that are far away from the original motor skill. Walking is a huge enabling event. You know, so crawling is good, but walking is better. Walking enables infants to go more, to see more, and to do more. These data show expert 12-month-old crawlers and novice 12-month-old walkers. Novice walkers spend way more time in motion than experienced crawlers. Novice walkers take twice as many steps, and novice walkers travel three times the distance of experienced crawlers. Walking also alters infants' view of the world, literally. <laughs> this is a crawling infant's view of the world. When babies are crawling, they see the floor right in front of their hands. But when babies are upright, the whole room swoops into view. 
These schematics show the average field of view for crawling compared to walking. While babies are crawling, they're mostly seeing the floor. While they're walking, they can see the whole room. The transition from crawling to walking also changes children's access to objects. So before infants can walk, they play with nearby objects, things that are within their arm's reach. This is the same baby now as a walker. After babies transition to walking, they travel greater distances. They explore objects that are further away. They go into other rooms. And not only are they visiting, you know, more distant objects, but even at the same age, walkers carry objects more compared with crawlers. So they go to distant objects and they bring objects to new locations, including to their caregivers for interactions. And that changes the way that caregivers speak to um, babies and that changes the language that babies hear and that changes their vocabularies. So motor skills are enabling. New motor skills create new opportunities for learning and for doing, like walking, for example, makes infants more likely to move. And so they travel further and they see distant things and they go to distant things and they carry objects to new locations. And that sets up a whole new retinue of social interactions. Motor skills can instigate a cascade of learning and development and domains that are far away from the original skill. So to sum it up, experience is embodied, embedded, enculturated, and enabling. Infants learn to behave in a changing body that is situated in a changing environment with changing layout and objects and people who themselves have changing social interactions and expectations and child rearing practices. New motor skills enable new opportunities for learning and for doing. And actually we have, we not just my lab, the field has the tools and technology to really deeply understand behavior and its development. Like we could in principle do all of it. We could know how the facts of the body and the surrounding environment and tasks and the social interactions and child rearing practices. And we could know about the enabling effects of behavior. So that's what I wanted to just sort of lay some groundwork. And um, there it is. <laughs> there you have it. Thank you, Karen. That was that was wonderful. Um, so the, the way we're, we're going to run the rest of this uh, event is we'll have a Q&A at the end. Um, so I see we've already got one question in the in the queue. Um, but before that, we'll have a, a dialogue with two uh, two undergraduate students here. Um, so if you guys want to turn your cameras on, so there's uh, Robin Wilford, who is um, a fourth year psychology student here, and uh, Juan Ardila Cifuentes, who's a, a final year uh, philosophy student, and they'll be um, uh, they'll be conducting uh, the, the dialogue with with Karen until. Uh, uh, until about the last 15 minutes of the hour, I think. Um, so, Juan. Thank you for that presentation, Karen. Um, I want to take a step back first, and I want to ask you, uh, can you tell us a little, bit, a little bit about your personal and academic history and how this journey has led you to doing the research you're doing now and some of the milestones that you've encountered? Oh, my goodness. Well, I... I sent you guys a thing and I'll just find it and um and use that as my as my um outline. Um so yeah, um I actually am somewhat of an imposter to motor development. I have zero background in math. I, I count on my fingers. I know nothing about anything, physics, biology, physiology, or even movement science. Um, I um, quit high school when I was 17, <laughs> moved out, and I worked as a proofreader and a seamstress. And um, I, um, I had a boyfriend for 17 years. Um, and 
that is only important because that was why I needed to get a job in New York. Uh, I went to four colleges and the fourth one I finally graduated, that was Sarah Lawrence College, and I graduated deeply in debt, <laughs> but I had worked in their preschool to work my way through school, so I had a lot of hands-on experience with young children. Um, Sarah Lawrence was like a liberal arts college, but if I had a major in anything, it would have been fine art. But I also had taken a perception class by a student of James Gibson. And so I was introduced to the ecological approach to perception and action. And when I was in college there, I read the census considered as perceptual systems and it was like discovering religion or something. I copied half that book into my journal. Um, I spent a year teaching at the Dalton School, um, kindergarten to third grade. I was the sewing and printmaking teacher. <laughs> And then I decided I wanted to do graduate studies. Um, so James Gibson was dead at that point, but Eleanor Gibson was alive um, and she was not allowed to take graduate students at Cornell anymore. So Dick Nicer had moved from Cornell to Emory and he brought Jackie Gibson and me to Emory. And when I was there, I studied infants perception of affordances for locomotion over slopes. It was horrifying. I nearly failed my qualifying exam because it was on the development of walking and the faculty had a big discussion about whether walking was part of psychology or not. Um, you know, of course, now I'm one of their, you know, touted <laughs> graduates, but at the time, um, walking was not considered part of psychology. So I wrote a pre-doctoral NRSA and I moved all my stuff to Indiana University um, where Esther Thielen was, um, had her lab and she studied walking and Indiana University thought walking could be part of psychology. And actually that grant that I wrote as a pre-doc, I have essentially renewed every year since whenever that was 1991 or 1989 or something like that um, up through the present day. Um, and I wrote my dissertation and all of my advisors who were Eleanor Gibson, Ulrich Nicer and Esther Thielen rejected my first dissertation. So I had to write a new one, um, but that one worked out pretty well and it became an SRCB monograph and an article in JEP. And then I still had that actor boyfriend. So I was trying to get a job in New York City I interviewed at NYU, but they didn't hire me. Um, Vassar offered me a job, but I didn't take it. And then I did a like a six month postdoc at Albert Einstein College so I could be in New York. And then I got a faculty position at Carnegie Mellon where I was commuting from Pittsburgh to New York. Um, and then a couple of years later, I interviewed again at NYU and this time I got the job, but right about that time, the I split up from my actor boyfriend and had found a new boyfriend who was a professor at, at so then I was backward commuting from New York to Pittsburgh um, for this um, new man, but then he got a job in New York and we got married and we had a daughter. And then, um, yeah, then, you know, we separated and very amicably. And then I started a commute with a professor at University of Iowa and we bought a house together in Maine and we've been together for like 12 or 13 years. So what else is there to say? Um, my longest <laughs> in-town relationship is also my longest collaboration. It's with um, an NYU colleague, Professor Kathy Thomas Lamanda and um, I, yeah, and so with Kathy, we are running the NIH Big Play Project and um, with Rick Gilmore, who's a professor at um, Penn State. And he was also my first teaching assistant at Carnegie Mellon. We direct the Databury Project. So that's that's my life right there. Yeah, there's a lot to dive into there, but it, it's so that we don't spend the whole hour on uh, just your I, relationship with Ellen. I would have to say, I, this, is, this is not a life path I would recommend for anyone, especially my own daughter. Like, just do the normal path. That, that's what I would recommend. I mean, uh, I'll keep that in mind. I'll, uh, I'll hand you over to Robin. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Um, 
So you mentioned that while you were doing your dissertation, there was this big debate about um, whether walking was psychology. I was wondering if you could elaborate on the history of the relationship between motor development research and psychology as a field um, mm -hmm. overall. Mm. Well, motor development research has been historically one of the first and sort of most complete areas of research. And the early researchers were in psychology departments, people like Arnold Gazelle and Myrtle McGraw. Um, but the, the way that they did their work and the way that it was interpreted was very much a maturation um, um, point of view. And, um, and because there was so much to describe and to catalog, sort of the received wisdom became, um, you know, like what happens when, and motor people have actually led the field of developmental science and how to record and, um, and analyze behavior. And so they were so good at it. It was kind of like by the 1940s, you know, like it had all been done, you know, they had described just about everything. And even, you know, some of my apparatuses and, you know, paradigms that I'm most proud of, drop-offs and slopes that I showed you, and, you know, I have gazillions of other um, cool things in my lab. Myrtle McGraw had done similar things, you know, back in the 20s and in the 30s. Um, so, so motor development is kind of like a, the start in a way of, you know, what's at the start and, and jump-started developmental science as a science, but then it fell out of favor. And so as I am very much a psychologist, I'm not a movement scientist, I'm not a motor control person, I am a developmental scientist. Um, but to be one in a psychology department, you have two options and I do both things. One option is to show how motor behaviors involve psychological functions like perception or cognition or memory or learning or something. Um, and the second option is to use motor behaviors as a model system for understanding some big issue in developmental science, like how, you know, how developmental processes work. So, for example, you know, when I talked about um, that, you know, I talked about developmental cascades in that little brief presentation, how change in one domain can reverberate through the system and actually instigate change in other domains that might seem like they're really far away. Um, well, it's quite easy to use motor behaviors as a model system because everything that happens is directly observable and you can directly record it. And so you can actually see how change is happening millisecond to millisecond, you know, minute to minute within a session, across sessions, across weeks, across months and so on. So, um, so it's kind of in a, it's a weird, it's a weird part of developmental psychology. You know, it's a chapter in every developmental textbook, but it's a really small part of developmental science. I mean, I think right now developmental science is, um, uh, what is it, you know, not overwhelmed, but you know, kind of the, the biggest area is social cognition and then probably language and cognition on equal footing. And perceptual development is actually kind of fallen to the wayside, but me and my students, motor development is here to stay. So I was wondering um, if we could briefly turn to where you start talking about real world applications for some of this research that you've been looking at. And in particular, you talked about the World Health Organization standards on parenting care uh, practices. So um, your research places a lot of importance on variation in development, specifically motor development. I was wondering if there are any real world applications you didn't cover that you're quite fascinated or for lack of a better term, obsessed with of this research, uh, whether you're pediatric or, or whichever. Yeah, no, I, I love that question. So first of all, let me say something about this freaking World Health Organization. They have standards, not norms. So they publish them explicitly as standards. The standard is prescriptive, not descriptive. A norm is descriptive, not prescriptive. And the World Health Organization published norms for when children are supposed to, you know, sit, stand, crawl, cruise, walk, 
and they didn't include any culture um, that constrains or exercises babies. You know, we did our research in Tajikistan, but Central, all over Central Asia, Central Asia is a huge part of the world. They're not in, you know, they weren't part of the data that the World Health Organization collected. And so there's something like absolutely perverted about saying that somebody is delayed relative to, you know, so like, like we, you know, Western people, like US babies, like we're the norm. And so these babies are accelerated relative to us. These babies are delayed relative. No, they're not. They weren't in the norms. Like, why are we the center of the norms? Like, why are we the, I mean, I can tell you why we're the norms because our not gazelle did the first norms. And so, you know, we have a US um, centric um, notion for motor development and we have a, what is it, you know, white educated, industrialized, rich democratic, weird um, is the acronym centric um, behavioral science. So all of psychology is weird science. Um, but I would say that for me, for my real world applications or implications or whatever, I talk all the time to pediatric um, physical and occupational therapists. And, um, and so what we're, so, you know, <laughs> these are people where their whole job is rests on the notion that the experiences they can give to children can change the course of these children's development, children who have some kind of developmental disability. If they didn't believe that experience mattered, they don't have a job and, you know, you're left with just, you know, pharmaceutical interventions and surgical interventions, which by the by, don't, don't do very much. They don't work. Um, and so um, it's very, very important for us to be discovering how, you know, typical development works. So, you know, if your average healthy baby, for example, averages 4,000, well, it's like 2,400 steps an hour. Um, what does that mean for a child with a developmental disability who can't do 2,400 steps in a week? Um, if a typical baby is built so that they can absorb errors just in the course of everyday activity. So it takes them, you know, what did I say? 1.8 seconds to get up from a fall. It can take 20 minutes for a child with cerebral palsy to recover from a fall. So I think that the implications are very easy and very straightforward. And actually, you know, so do pediatric clinicians. You know, we really do need to know how typical development works. Um, and, you know, and I think it's really important to not, to not call it motor development. It's behavioral development. That's what we're talking about, behavioral development. Every kind of behavior involves moving something. When you talk, you're moving your mouth. When you have facial, you know, when you express yourself, you're moving your face, when you, et cetera. You know, when you're looking at things and learning about the world, you're moving your eyes. You're always moving something. Thanks, Karen. Um, so in the paper, you highlight the importance of be behavioral flexibility in behavioral development. And I was wondering if you could um, share with us a little bit more how this is reflected in the experimental methodologies that we saw in the videos um, and, and how those things are, are, are related. Yeah, so to my mind, behavioral flexibility means knowing if there's an action you, you could do or should do that's in your repertoire. Um, being able to modify ongoing actions. So being able to select the right action, modify ongoing actions and invent or create or discover new behaviors on the fly in the moment. That's behavioral flexibility. Of course it involves perception. It has to because you, you know, like the whole point is to suit your actions to the current situation. So you have to do something to generate information. What's my body like right now? What's the environment like right now? What is the thing I need to do right now? Um, and that requires behavioral flexibility. So, I mean, I've put it another way, which is it, it's not really like infants are learning to move. It's like they're learning to learn to move. So what they're, they're not learning fixed solutions. They're learning how to come up with the right solution right in this moment.
So you mentioned uh, a term that I've been pretty obsessed with lately, and that's the notion of affordances, something that most ecological psychologists are quite familiar with. Um, and I kind of wanted to ask you what definition of affordance you commit yourself to and whether or not it differs from conventional notions of affordances uh, or if it, it's how similar it is to them. I don't know anymore what's a conventional notion of affordance. There was what James Gibson said, there's what Eleanor Gibson said, there's what the Connecticut crowd has said. Um, and, you know, right now I'm, one of my grants is with um, people in artificial intelligence and um, computer vision and so on, and they love the notion of affordances, but their notion is something more like Don Norman's notion of affordances, you know, it's more like with, um, has to do with more, with maybe with design. Um, I would say I side with James Gibson in the sense that if you have a construct, it has to be a useful one. And a useful construct is useful for research, for guiding research questions and for telling you when you have a good answer. And so um, in my presentation, every time I said possibilities for action, you could have replaced that with affordance. But you could also just call it a possibility for action and that's just plain English and there's no spin on it, right? So to me, an affordance is the fit between you know, an animal's current capabilities and the current features of the environment that allows the particular action to be performed. And that is not controversial in any way because, you know, for an action to be possible, dude, it has to be possible. And so in principle, one could list all the things that have to be in place for that action to be possible. Um, the part that is controversial is whether we perceive affordances or animals perceive affordances or, you know, human infants perceive affordances. And if they do, how do they do it? Um, and, um, you know, and so that part could be controversial. Is it direct perception or blah, 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 or, you know, do you learn them? Blah, blah, blah. But the fact that there are possibilities for action, some actions are possible and some are not. Um, and, you know, best to only do the possible ones pretty much as you go around in the world, that part is not controversial at all. Um, and so in my lab, we have a whole number of ways of testing um, um, whether babies or children or adults can perceive possibilities for action and how accurately they do so. And so I um, generally use um, psychophysical methods where I have lots of trials for each participant and I'm varying something in the environment. Sometimes we'll have different conditions where we vary something about the person experimentally, like, you know, make them top heavy or make, you know, their body uneven or, you know, put them in a pregnancy pack or whatever. Um, and, oh golly, you know, we, and all of the apparatuses are, are sort of continuously adjustable doorways that vary in width or overhead clearance or underfoot, you know, barriers, obstacles or bridges of different widths and gaps of different sizes and drop offs of different heights and slopes of different steepnesses, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, we just make up stuff that seems like it would be fun and funny to do and then, and then create an apparatus that is continuously adjustable. And then we test whoever on the apparatus. Um, and then it's essentially the, the game is like, this is what the actual affordance function looks like. So, you know, it's not a step function, like actions are possible at some high rate near 200%. And then they become impossible. And there's, you know, a sigmoidal function. And then you ask, you know, you can ask, does perception map into that? So, you know, is the perception curve of what they perceive to be possible um, on top of the actual affordance function? Are those two functions coincident or is one, you know, are they like kind of, you know, more or less on one side of the tail? So it, it's, uh, I mean, so you remain faithful to the, the uh, affordances as, uh, pred as predicting function, predicting functions. Um, that you said in their 2014 paper with, I don't know how to, forgive me if I say his name wrong, but John Frank Cax. Um, Franchax. Franchax. Yeah. 
uh, you, so you were, you, you were, you were, you remain faithful to that definition of reforms that you gave in that paper, right? Yeah, I think I, I, I remain faithful to the idea that an affordance is the fit between animal and environment or body and environment that allows a particular action to be performed. So considering your your view that you know perception and action are so tightly coupled together, um, do you what is your opinion about being able to separate those two to study them in an experimental situation? Um, I think you can get measures of, you know, sort of what the action is and measures of what the perception is. But as you're collecting those measures, you know, if you're having someone actually do something, they're always perceiving and acting. I can't believe um, you guys are undergraduates and you're asking these questions. You're making me so happy. You're going to have to blame those who have indoctrinated us. Come right here to graduate school. <laughs> well, this is what happens when you work with Vicente Ed and, and Dr. Anderson for a year and a half. You just you drink the Kool Aid. Um, so I want to ask one last question relating uh, your research to another interest I have is um, what do you think? Hey, or can you elaborate a little more on the relationship between motor development and other higher cognitive functions? So, you know, in for example, in cases of social interactions or um, conceptual metaphor theories. Okay, I don't know what a conceptual metaphor theory is, but I, I'm not sure what you're asking. So, um, what I, I was wondering if you could elaborate on like the relationship between the de motor de or behavioral development, I should say, and language acquisition, for example, um, or uh, the quote unquote ability to have a theory of mind. Oh, goodness. Well, I, I'm not going to talk about theory of mind, but I'll talk about language. So um, it turns out, and this isn't my lab, but it turns out from lots of other labs that infants learn new words most best <laughs> um, when somebody says the name of the object while the baby is interacting with the object while they're doing something. So the baby's holding the soda can and the mom says, are you drinking my soda? Are you drinking my soda? That's, that's the better chance for the baby to learn the word soda than if they're not doing that. Um, and what we're finding, and I, I, sh I shouldn't even say we, so um, this is really led by Kathy Thomas Amanda and an amazing postdoc, Kelsey West, um, and Sandy Gonzalez, a postdoc, um, that what you do, what you know, like what children do, especially babies, influences the language that they hear. And babies can't learn words, children can't learn words unless they're hearing them. And so what they do influences what they hear. And so it turns out it's not just, you know, touching objects, but like if babies are moving, they're more likely to hear verbs. And once babies can walk, they're more likely to touch a greater variety of objects. And so that prompts caregivers just naturally, like they're not trained to do this, but to talk about a greater variety of objects. So now the babies are hearing more words. And so that is, you know, boosting their vocabulary. Um, so this is really this idea of developmental cascades. And the idea only has any weight to it if you can actually show all the intermediate steps in the cascade. And so we actually are doing that for motor skills and word learning. You know, so language in that case. Um, I don't really want to touch theory of mind because, I mean, you know, I teach it in developmental psych, you know, blah, blah, blah. But there's so many hateful things about that whole construct and the way it is set up. Please don't make me waste time talking about it. Okay. It's all right. I feel the same way. We don't have to continue discussing it. I think, though, it's time to turn to the QA session. So if Ed, you want to, bring in some Q&A 
some questions. Robin and I can step back from, from here on. Thank you, Karen, for having a, a, a discussion with Robin. And yes, thank so, you. Uh, so we already have some questions in the Q&A. If, if you're in the audience and you want to ask your question live, um, then please post your question in the Q&A and I'll try to get through um, I'll try to get through some questions. I won't get to everyone. Uh, but the first the first question is from Marie Matos. Hi, hi, Karen. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm talking from Portugal. So greetings from Portugal. Um, I had some comments that I put on, on, on but uh, one of the questions was about some possible hampering of motor development when we are uh, speaking about uh, acquiring some motor skills at some certain ages. Because we always say, well, if we begin later or if we begin early, the question was, when you said that the restriction that some children suffer, for instance, in the cars, et cetera, and make them, uh, for instance, begin to walk later. Let's imagine at uh, 14 months instead of nine, 10, 12. Is there any scientific <laughs> evidence? They're walking yeah. up in 20 months instead yeah. of 12 yeah. months. Is there any scientific evidence that uh, some months of uh, difference in these ages have uh, any consequences? I, I, I believe not, but... Yeah, there, yeah there's, there's a, a, a ton of evidence that in the moment, having new skills changes opportunities for learning. So a baby who is, you know, 12 months old and walking or an early walker at nine months, they're going to have new opportunities. Now, nobody has studied whether waiting to walk till you know sixteen or eighteen months. Um, and I'll just talk about it like in Portugal or in the U.S. If a baby, let's say, if a baby walked at sixteen months, which is still very much in the normal range, versus walked at ten months, which is also in the normal range. Well, the sixteen-month-old is also like a smarter, bigger baby than the 10 month old. So they might be more prepared to benefit from the, these new opportunities for learning. So, um, but definitely, and there is lots of research, some by me and some by other people, um, showing that in the moment, new skills, being able to sit up, to control your eyes, your head, your trunk, your arms, your hands, manual actions, locomotor actions, postural, all, any, any and all of it, open up new opportunities for learning. There's no good evidence that it matters in the long run. So like these children in Tajikistan who are starting to walk between 16 and 20 months instead of between you know 10 and 15 mm -hmm. months or whatever here. Um, you know, we're we're filming these babies who really look, you know, like like ooh. and we're watching their siblings run through the video frames. And so um, we're still analyzing the data, but we got another grant to um, to follow up on the children and to look at preschoolers and you know to to ask whether there's any evidence of any long term effects of having been cradled. And there's really nothing. Um, and in fact, <laughs> um, in in Tajikistan, you know, like the the three and four year olds we were studying are like climbing huge ladders and walking over little narrow bridges and doing all kinds of activities that you know you would never let your child do and I never would have let Lily do. Um, and that that is also true, you know, for other cultures where children are constrained because, um, like essentially to keep them safe. Um, there's. So there's some data, like, but it's bad data. So I don't know how much I trust it. Mm -hmm. um, that some kinds of constraint that, in, especially if it involves social isolation and social deprivation are just bad. It's like taking a hammer to development. And then there's long-term permanent effects. But, you know, Central Asia is doing fine. You know, like they, in fact, the people we work with, English is usually their fourth or fifth language. <laughs> like they're totally fine. Like they're better than fine, you know. They they win wars. They 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 do all the things that everyone needs to do. They compete in the Olympics. Like they're great. And um, we asked one of our translators at one point, like, you know, what skills do people in like what do people in Tajikistan do? Like, do you guys play soccer? Like, 
you know, dance, like, what's your thing? And he's like, eh, we ride horses. And he's like, who rides horses? Everyone. What do you mean? Well, children? Yeah. Like, you know, my three-year-old can ride a horse. Well, my three-year-old couldn't ride a horse. She couldn't even ride a bike. So, yeah. So the, the real answer, the short answer is immediate, yes, immediate, tons of data saying there's immediate short-term effects, at least yeah. on opportunities for learning. There's but chill and catch up. Data, and eventually, when any eventually. study that shows, you know, like long-term effects, there's another study that failed to find mm -hmm. long-term effects on the same variables. So I don't believe that, I, I don't think there's any reliable or robust evidence that there's long-term effects, so long as you're in the normal range for your culture. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rhi. Um, so I have another question here that's, uh, I'm just going to read from the Q&A. So this is from Ana Moreno Nunez. Uh, and it's sort of um, a related question, I guess. Uh, so the question is, what is the role that uh, adults play in all of these changes in children's development that you showed in your talk? And do they, does, is the role of the adult, is it a, a mediating role, would you say? Um, are, are they mediating by prevent, providing They can mediate, they can moderate, they can instigate, they can do, you know, very little. Um, I think the part that has been overlooked that is really important is just like sort of the things that you don't think about, like how to dress and carry and hold and bathe and feed your child. Those things have huge effects. Um, and, and now there's really good experimental data showing that, you know, if you hold your baby, you know, and I'm talking U.S. babies randomly assigned to treatment and control groups. You know, you hold them in a way that makes them have to fight gravity a little more. They're going to get, you know, like the whole cascade starts earlier. So, okay, Derek. Here we go. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, I wanted to sort of push you on whether some of the ideas that you're talking about have been sort of developed in parallel to other uh, areas of the literature, or if you're exp expressly intending to draw on that. So when you're talking about experience being sort of encultured, enabling, uh, and all of those uh, E words embodied and whatnot, then it sounds a lot like some of like the notion of the ontogenetic niche uh, that you find in the post-genomic literature. So are you expressly intending to draw on that or is this just sort of uh, ideas that you've developed in parallel? I think it's more in parallel. Um, I love the idea of an ontogenetic niche, but I don't know that where what I think it is and the people that I'm drawing on are the same people that you guys are drawing on. I mean, I'm really, really not a philosopher. And I, I, you know, every time you, you all name drop, I have no idea who you're talking about or what you're talking about. <laughs> so, um, so we might be in total agreement or not. I, I don't know. So I guess quick sort of translational follow-up if I can. Um, when you're talking frequently in that literature, they talk about scaffolding development. Uh, and you use the the terms uh, affording opportunities. Uh, or do you take those to be strictly synonymous or is there some other kind of um, framework that might be in play there? So for me, I would reserve the term scaffolding to mean pretty much what Vygotsky said it meant because it's his term and he had a really good idea and I, I don't think we need to change it. Um, but, you know, in my training by Eleanor Gibson, her, her rule of thumb was if you want to know about learning, the first thing you do is you describe the opportunity. So like, let's just take something totally different. Like if you want to know if a fetus could be learning while in the womb, first you have to know what's happening inside the womb. Like does light get in? Yeah, actually it does. Not pattern light, but light. Does sound get in? Totally. Does, you know, can it feel accelerations and, you know, translations of the mother's body? Totally, yes. You know, can it feel pressure? You know, yeah, you know, so, and you can measure all those things empirically and quantify them. So, yes, there's opportunities for learning. The second thing is, is your organism sensitive to those, you know, forms of stimulation? So, you know, like if it's a fetal rat and the eyes are fused shut, then let's, you know, have have the you know the perceptual systems come online so that they actually can be sensitive to it and then finally you ask do you profit from those opportunities and so i think the 
the state of the art is more still about describing opportunities um, and less about the second two things, you know, whether the, the human infant or child is sensitive to those opportunities um, and then whether they take advantage of it. And it could be, you know, like one of our grants looks at how children learn the sort of hidden affordances of everyday artifacts, like, you know, like a soda can like this with a pop top. How does a child ever learn that you have to flip that thingy down and then push it back to drink out of the can? Or even, you know, like twisting the lid of a bottle, like somebody somewhere decided lefty loosey, righty tighty, but how does a child learn twisting and then twist to the left, to open, twist to the right, you know? Um, and, you know, and, and well, one of my doctoral students just gave, gave a talk like an hour ago about what, you know, do they profit from social information? So what kind of social information do they receive from caregivers and are they profiting from it? And um, there's lots of social information from caregivers. A lot of it is not very good quality, um, but some of it is. But it also seems like children may not be paying attention to it. And now that I'm on this role, I'll tell you one thing that's relevant is, you know, every country has... Um, you know, like some kind of guidelines for things like child resistant packaging. And in the United States, child resistant packaging, you would show your child like a thing like this, and then um, children of a certain age, and you give them five minutes to try to open it. So they can you get the soda out, try to open it. Um, if they can't open it, then the researcher is supposed to say, look, here's how I do it. And then you you do it and you open it. And then you give them their object and you say, you have another five minutes, can you open it? I don't think the children are looking. I don't think they can see what the hand is doing. I don't think they're looking at the hand. You know, and I don't, I think that's because we have had mounted eye trackers on them. You know, like the person starts talking, they're looking at the person's face. So like they're getting social information, but they're not getting it because they're not actually, you know, they're not, they're not getting the right stuff at the right time. You see what I'm saying? So basically, you know, keep a lock on all your poisons because child resistant packaging is, is a farce. It's worse, the, the science behind it shouldn't even be called science. Um, but it's a really good example of this whole idea of, you know, like, are there opportunities? Are you sensitive to them? And then do you profit from it? Wonderful. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, Derek. Um, so let's try to get a couple more questions in, um, and then we'll we'll end. So Mika. Hi. Thank you so much for your for your talk. I am really excited about the idea of um, kind of embodied cascades and in development, and was wondering how you or are there kind of rules of thumb or ways that you think about approaching creating good experiments or studies to study something that's so complex because your your talk highlighted so many variables that go into development and i'm wondering how you separate at, like just enough so that you can just correlate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i feel like if i could have paid you to ask a question that's the question i would have paid for and <laughs> And I, I said the same thing in your lab meeting yesterday, Ed, but I'll just say it again. I think that no researcher in developmental science has all the expertise that we need. We just can't. I mean, you have to study the development of something. So I focus on motor behaviors, but someone else learns about language and someone else focuses on you know emotional development or whatever. Um, and so what you really need to do is get everybody together to do sort of group science at scale so that we can leverage each other's expertise. And we are actually doing that. So we have this great big NIH project called Play and Learning Across a Year. You can look it up at playproject.org. Um, and um, we have 65 uh, you know, professors across the US and Canada and, um, and we're together you know, using a protocol that we spent, you know, like 18 months developing together, collecting a thousand plus hours of infant mother activity, natural activity in their home. And then 
you know, in that 18 months, we also figured out what would be like the foundational codes so that someone like me doesn't really know much about language or, you know, I don't know, emotional development or gender development or whatever, that I would have some variables already there that I could analyze relative to my, um, you know, to my expertise in motor development. And so these thousand hours of videotape are being transcribed fully for everything the mother says, all the vocalizations by the baby, then the mother's um, language is coded um, into the pragmatics, the mother and baby gestures, manual gestures. Every time the mother and baby are touching an object or interacting with an object, every time they move, move their body from one, you know, one spot to another, every time they show positive or negative affect, um, and then we have a ton of data about what their homes look like and a ton of demographic data and questionnaires that these expert groups said, you know, you have to collect if you want, you know, these kinds of variables to be meaningful. And then that entire humongous data set is um, going to be all um, stored and shared, openly shared on the Databrary library so that, you know, you and Ed and everyone else on this call could get access and you could do your own analyses. And on top of that, we built all the infrastructure, including, you know, like the data view coding tool and, and you know, websites and wikis with, you know, everything documented in video. So you can see exactly how to do every single thing. Um, and then, um, and, and, you know, and remote training so we can train you how to analyze and deal with video data, you know, blah, 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 to ask your own questions, not our questions. And, you know, do I think this has legs? Well, you know, this week I just got a grant from the Environmental Protection Agency um, who is interested in how, you know, babies' hand-to-mouth behavior and object-to-mouth behavior might inadvertently expose them to contaminants and dust. And, um, and we're just doing the exact protocol from play and then collecting some little dust samples on top of it. And the fact that this infrastructure exists and we know how to do it um, made this grant, you know, fundable by a totally different agency. So obviously I don't know first thing about dust, but, you know, my team does the behavioral work and then we have like these dust guys and, you know, like this chemist guy who like spins it like, you know, CSI, you know, da, 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 and pulls out all the poisons and contaminants and whatever. Um, it can all be done. Like, you know, we could be doing global play, whatever. So we focused on infant development because that's what I care about. And I had to be the PI. But if you're interested in whatever it is you're interested in, that's the way to do it. You can't get all the expertise yourself. You have to get that you have to build the infrastructure to get the right people together. And the right people are just basically smart enough, nice people, you know, who can collaborate and who can represent their field. That's a That's powerful great. idea. Thank you. It That's takes great. a lot of money though. So, you know, the play, pro like you need gazillions of dollars to do it, but, but people will pay for this because, you know, we're doing it. We got the money. Thanks, Mika. Um, so let's let's make this the last question, um, Edison. You have to unmute. You're, you're muted. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Edson from Brazil. Oh uh, uh, thank you for your talk. My question was it very similar with the, the previous one. I, I was going to ask you that your view of motor development entails combining knowledge from different dimensions, biology, psychology, anthropology, sociology. Uh, and that is a difficult thing to do because they usually use different modes of description, explanations, and so on. And I was going to ask you how to conduct a research like that. <laughs> Uh, in, in some ways, you have already answered that in the, in, for the previous question. Uh, the, the other part of my question is, is how to guide the students to this interdisciplinary journey. Because I, it's very today, I think the 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 the, the courses are so narrow-minded, at least in Brazil, 
uh, it's difficult to have a student to, to, to have this big scope, wide scope. Uh, and I was wondering, I like very much our paper, this, uh, the object of this talk. Thank you. Uh, and giving this, this wide perspective of motor development, which I think it's very interesting. Uh, and if I give I think, you, I think you have to do two things at once okay. for students. So I think I think for for students to be successful in academics, they're going to have to build their own research program. So they have to get you know deep expertise on a little crappy thing that, that's hopefully really interesting. But that's the, that's how they're going to succeed, and that's fine. But at the same time, I think we should be teaching our students about a new way of doing science and thinking about science. Um, and I guess this is recorded. I'm trying to decide if I should say it. I, I like pre-registering studies and all of that. That's not even a panacea. That's nothing. What you really need is to document everything that you're doing and make it openly shareable. That doesn't mean necessarily with the public. That means with other researchers. And again, this is something that is doable because we're doing it. You know, so Databury has an ethical policy framework that protects human subjects, so you don't have to blur their faces or ding out their, you know, their words or their voices or alter it and turn them into avatars. Um, but you can bring, you know, people together. So. Um, so I've focused on the groups that I have access to and that I'm, I'm personally most interested in, like artificial intelligence and um, clinicians and you know, that kind of thing. But of course you could do the same things in you know, physical and social anthropology and in biology and in sociology, um, but you need a way to really document everything. And I think for behavior, video is the very best way to do it. I mean, I use lots of other technologies as well, but I use them along with video. Like you need, you, you know, um, look at any of my recent empirical papers, you know, like we're sending people like, you wanna know about the procedure? It's like, fine, here's a little, <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. When I had gotten my first job at Carnegie Mellon and I wrote my first paper all on my own um, and I sent it to child development and it was a paper about how, how babies learn to crawl. And the action editor, who, you know, it's like a totally um, great guy, and we're friends, he wrote back and said, seriously, you have like four pages of method. If we can explain how to clone Dolly the lamb in two paragraphs, surely you can get your thing down to like a page or two. And so I did. And, I, and all my papers, you know, now have the appropriate sized method section. But nobody's method section in a behavioral study is sufficient for somebody to know what you really did. And so the reproducibility crisis, it might be because, you know, findings aren't robust, but it's but, but before you could even ask that question, you have to be able to do the study. And there's so many details that, you know, you can't write in a method section, but you could see it if you had it on video. So, I think that's what we need to be teaching our students. Yes, dive down deep and build your own research program on a narrow area that you can be the world expert on. But at the same time, learn about this more open and transparent way of doing science that really is interdisciplinary and really can be openly shared. Thank you very much. Thanks, Edison. And that's, thanks, Karen. That's a really important point, I think, and a good one to end on. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I will end there. I'd like to thank um, Robin and Juan again for asking some pointed questions. And uh, thank you so much, Karen, for joining us. It's been, it's been fascinating. It's been opinionated and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Okay. I hope there's more. I love you guys. So, so much fun to talk to people who have similar ideas and interests. Yeah, Even if we great. disagree, it's still super fun. So thank you for inviting me. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Thank you.